one that April with his surest sort, the drucht of Merch hath pierced to the root. As soon as April pierces to the root the drought of March, and bathes each bud and shoot through every vein of sap with gentle showers, from whose engendering liquor spring the flowers, when zephyrs have breathed softly all about, inspiring every wood and field to sprout, and in the zodiac the youthful sun his journey halfway through the ram has run, when little birds are busy with their song, who sleep with open eyes the whole night long, life stirs their hearts and tingles in them so. On pilgrimages people long to go, and palmers to set out for distant strands, and foreign shrines renowned in many lands. And specially in England, people ride to Canterbury from every countryside to visit there the blessed martyred saint who gave them strength when they were sick and faint. And specially in England, people ride to Canterbury from every countryside. The religious pilgrimage during the Middle Ages was something on which every pious man and woman hoped to go. In England, the destination of most pilgrims was the shrine of the murdered Archbishop of Canterbury, St. Thomas a Becket. Such a pilgrimage from every shire's end was part of that colorful tapestry which made up life in Geoffrey Chaucer's England. Chaucer, portrayed here in a 14th century manuscript, reading his poems to a courtly audience, was born about the year 1340. Thus, his life spanned the last years of the colorful 14th century, and no man knew better the conditions of English life during this period than Chaucer himself. He knew the rhythms of country life and the people who worked the soil. He himself had once served in a campaign against the French in the Hundred Years' War. He knew the townspeople of England, the merchants, weavers, craftsmen. He held many government posts during his lifetime, controller of customs, commissioner of roads, member of parliament, and traveled about the country, meeting and dealing with the English men and women he was later to write about in his Tales of Canterbury. One that April with his surest sort, the drucht of merch hath pierced to the rot, and father... Chaucer wrote his tales of Canterbury in the language of his time. It is called Middle English. Befell that in that season on a dive, in Southwark at the tabard as he lay, ready to wenden on me pilgrimage to Canterbury with full devout courage. At nicht was come into that hostelria well mean and twenty in a compania of sundry folk, the aventuri falla in fellowship. And pilgrims were they all that toward Canterbury Walden read. And translated into modern English. In Southern at the tabard one spring day it happened as i stopped there on my way myself a pilgrim with a heart devout ready for canterbury to set out at nightfall to that very inn resorted no less a group than 29 assorted people a company that chanced to fall in fellowship together 
for they were all pilgrims who meant to ride to Canterbury. Chaucer's pilgrims set out for Canterbury, 59 miles distant from London, and to pass the time, they decided to tell stories as they rode. The storytellers are the English men and women Chaucer knew so well. They are a cross-section of medieval England. A knight was with us, and an excellent man, who from the earliest moment he began to follow his career, loved chivalry, truth, open-handedness, and courtesy. The wife of Bath. She had been an excellent woman all her life. Five men in turn had taken her to wife. The miller. He was a thick, squat-shouldered lump of sins. The partner is one of Chaucer's finest characterizations. Partners were familiar figures in medieval England, going about the country selling pardon for sin. But Chaucer's partner, though in church a noble ecclesiast, is without doubt one of English literature's strangest creations. The tale that we have heard has made me sick. Good partner, tell us a merry one and be quick. But nothing coarse or ribald. Let him tell some moral story and we'll listen well. I will and gladly. But while I try to think of something edifying, I'll take a drink. The tale which the partner finally tells has been called one of the great short stories of the English language. But in telling it, the partner frankly reveals himself to his fellow pilgrims as a hypocrite. In churches, when my moment comes to preach, I use, my lord, a lofty style of speech and ring it out as roundly as a bell knowing by rote all that I have to tell. Allow me in a few words to explain my method. I never preach except for gain. Oh, <laughs> for that my text is always and ever was radix malorum est cupiditas. Radix malorum est cupiditas? The root of all evil is avarice. What? Preach against the same vice he indulges? That's why his purse is so fat that it bulges. <laughs> but don't forget, though I myself may burn with greed, I can make other people turn from avarice and teach them to repent. Still, that is not my principal intent. What? Do you think while I have power to preach and take in silver and gold for what I teach, I shall ever live in willful poverty? No, no, that was never my thought, certainly. So I bring in old stories, many a one, tales and examples drawn from days long done. Plain folk love tales that come down from of old. Such things their minds can well report and hold. <laughs> Your tale, good partner but not of sin. Story. Now for my story. Keep quiet and I'll begin. There was a company of young folk living one time in Flanders who were bent on giving their lives to folly and extravagance. They haunted brothels, taverns, held wild dances with lutes, harps and guitars gambled for hours, and also ate and drank beyond their powers, paying the devil sinful sacrifice in the devil's temple with their drink and dice. These three young roisterers of whom I tell, long before Prime had rung from any bell, were seated in a tavern at their drinking. And as they sat, they heard... My luck! <laughs> Listen! There 
bell goes clinking before a corpse being carried to his grave. Boy! Boy! Uh, boy! Boy, here! Good sir! What is your will? Go out and try to learn whose corpse is being carried by. Get me his name and get it right. Take he. Sir, I tell you there isn't any need. I learned before you came here by two hours. He was, as it happens, an old friend of yours. And all at once, there, on his bench, upright as he was sitting drunk, he was killed last night. A sly thief. Death, men call him, who deprives all the people in this country of their lives, came with his spear and smiting his heart in two, went on his business with no more ado. A thousand have been slaughtered by his hand during this plague. Now by Saint Peter. The boy speaks truth. Man, woman, laborer, servant and child, this death has slain this year. In a big village, a mile or more from here. I think it is his place of habitation. It would be wise to make some preparation before a man brings himself to disgrace. Now, by the holy saint, so that's the case. Is it so dangerous with this thief to meet? I'll look for him by every path and street. Hear me, my friends. We are all one, we three. Let each of us hold out his hand to the other. Let each of us become his fellow's brother. We'll slay this death who slaughters and betrays. He shall be slain whose hand so many slays by the dignity of God before the night. Aye, aye. <laughs> <laughs> and in their drunken frenzy up they get, and toward the village off at once they set, which the innkeeper had spoken of before. And many were the grisly oaths they swore. <laughs> but when they had hardly gone the first half mile. What's this? you meet with evil grace. Why all wrapped up except your face? What you be alive so many a year? Because I can, though I should walk to India, find no man in any village or any city or town who for my age is willing to lay down his youth. So I must keep my old age still for as long a time as it may be God's will. Nor will death take my life from me, O Lord. Thus, like a restless prisoner, I pass, and on the ground, which is my mother's gate, I walk, and with my staff, both early and late, I knock and say, Dear mother, let me in. See how I banish flesh and blood and skin. Alas, when will my bones be laid to rest? But, sirs, you do yourselves small courtesy to speak to an old man so churlishly. I charge you, therefore, no harm or wrong here to an old man do, no more than you would have men do to you in your old age. No voice in your no beggar. As for me, you won't be let off so easily. You spoke just now of that false traitor, Death, who in this land robbed all our friends of breath. Tell where he is, since you must be his spy. Or you will suffer for it, so say I. You are in league with Death, false thief, and bent on killing us young folks, that's clear to my mind. If you are so impatient, sir, as to find this Death... Aye, we are. Turn up this crooked way. For in that grove I left him, truth to say, 
beneath a tree. And there will he abide. No boast of yours will make him run and hide. You see that oak tree? There you will find this death. And God, whose grace redeems mankind, save and amend you. Each of these three gamblers ran until he reached the tree. And there they found... Gold. Light, glittering and bright. <laughs> now, my sworn brothers, listen to what I say. My head is sharp for all I joke and play. Fortune has given us this pile of treasure to set us up in lives of ease and pleasure. <laughs> Lightly it is come, likely we'll make it go. By my soul, salvation. Who was to know we'd ever tumble on such luck today? If we could only carry this gold away home to my house. Eh? Or either one of yours. <laughs> For well we know that all this gold is ours. We touch the summit of felicity. But still. By daylight, how is that to be? People would think us thieves, too bold for self. And they'd have us hanged for our own wealth. It must be done at night. That's our best plan. As prudently and slyly as we can. And my proposal is that we should all draw a lot. And let us see on whom the lot will fall. And the one of us who draws the shortest stick shall run back to the town and make it quick and bring us bread and wine here on the sly and... Two of us will keep a watchful eye over this gold. And uh, if he doesn't stay too long in town, we'll carry this gold away, wherever we all agree it's best. Ah, oh, dear. You know that by sworn oath you are my brother. I'll tell you something you can profit by. Our friend is gone, that's clear to any eye. And here is gold, abundant as can be, which we propose to share alike, we three. But if I work it out uh, as I could do, 
so that it might be shared between us two. Wouldn't that be a favor, a friendly one? Well, true enough, but how that can be done, I don't quite see. He knows we have the gold. What shall we do? What shall he be told? Will you keep the secret tucked inside your head? Oh, I won't betray you. That you can believe. Now, we are two, as you can well perceive. And two of us must have more strength than one. When he sits down... Get up as if in fun and wrestle with him. While you play this game, I'll run him through the ribs. <laughs> you do the same with that dagger there. And then this gold shall be divided, my dear friend, between you and me. and the bread, as you told me. But I have little stomach for it now. Ah, uh, what you need, my friend, is play. Come, I'll show you how. his body later on. First, we'll be merry. <laughs> Did I tell you something to profit by? Our friend is gone. That's clear to any eye. <laughs> now, all that we desire, we can fulfill. And the two of us can roll the dice at will. Drink and drink well. <laughs> Ah. 
Father, they both perished for their homicide. And thus the treacherous poisoner also died. Oh, sin, accursed above all cursedness. Oh, treacherous murder. Oh, foul wickedness. And oh, good men, your sins may God forgive. And free from wretched avarice may you live. Sirs, thus I preach. But now, one word forgot I in my tale. I've relics in my pouch that cannot fail, as good as England ever saw, I hope, the which I got by kindness of the Pope. It is an honor for each one that's here that you should have a competent pardoner to give you absolution as you ride because of mishaps that may still be tied. There may be falls from horses, one or two, or broken necks, you know. It might be you. Step up, Sir Host, and offer. You begin, for you're the one who's most consumed in sin. Come, kiss the relics and loosen up your purse. Not so, my friend, or I should have Christ's curse. What, kiss your relics? Not for love nor riches, you'd make me kiss a piece of your old britches. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Good friend, this has gone far enough. Sir Pardner, be glad and merry here. And you, Sir Host, who are to me so dear, I pray you, forgive the Pardner. That I will. My hand in turn, good host. And now, may God, our soul's great healer, show you how within his pardon evermore to rest. For that, I do not lie, good friend, is best. And so Chaucer's pilgrims, united in good fellowship once again, take leave of the inn and continue on their way. And as they ride, they tell each other stories, stories which taken all together make up one of the great monuments of English literature, Geoffrey Chaucer's Tales of Canterbury.